My name is Linda Gale Becker. I'm a infectious diseases doctor, clinician. I've been working in HIV in the southern tip of Africa for 25 years. Um, my passion is making sure that the best possible care is brought to those who are least likely to access uh, treatment uh, around the world. And uh, my work is really centered around HIV, tuberculosis and, and related conditions in Africa. So I have been in this business for many decades and um, health inequity, I think, was particularly prevalent or, or obvious um, in the early 2000s when we became very aware that antiretroviral treatment, HIV treatment, could change the course of people living with HIV, really turning it from a, a terminal illness uh, with definite death um, to a, a, a chronic illness where people could live with their condition. But the big problem was that the drugs were in the Northern Hemisphere and we did not, we weren't able to access them simply because of price and also because of access. Uh, they just weren't available for us uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's been a long fight to get antivirals, uh, to have them available for people. Uh, and the amazing thing is that when we were able to access these treatments, people responded just as well as they did in the Northern Hemisphere. And we've really been able to change the course of the HIV uh, epidemic in that sense. And although life expectancy had plummeted 20 years um, in the countries in the southern uh, part of Africa, we've really seen that turn around. So the amazing uh, difference it can make to have access to medicines that are life-saving is, is absolutely, uh, you know, imprinted in my mind and in my life. Uh, you know, subsequently, this continues though. Um, we've lived through that terrible era um, and we still see uh, unavailability of, of life-saving medication or unaffordability of those medications. And where I work, amongst the poorest of the poor, uh, these are the individuals who are least likely to access these life-saving treatments. So even in 2023, there are treatments that are available to, to the rich uh, and those life-saving commodities are withheld from those who are poor. I think the first thing is really awareness from the get-go. So when there is a decision to develop a medication, I think already there needs to be a plan on the ground as to how this will reach the furthest parts of the world. Because I think, you know, trying to catch up once a commodity is is shown to be successful and, uh, and useful, then trying to walk that plan back um, and, and make the changes then I think is more difficult. So having a concept of something being a global good, something that really, uh, you know, it can save lives around the world, that, that needs to have a very specific plan from the get-go. Uh, and I think if, if, if companies have that mindset right from the beginning, I think, you know, we, we can, in, in a way, work with them, recognizing, of course, that these are businesses, there are shareholders, uh, and, you know, research and development costs money. So I think we're not asking that companies do this, you know, entirely philanthro with philanthropy in, in mind, but there is a need to have a different approach when uh, a particular uh, product or, or medicine can be life-saving in, in, across the world, um, but because of cost or because it isn't, you know, being regulated in a particular part of the world, it isn't getting there. I think access to Medicine Foundation is unique because it is coming at the problem from a, a number of different angles. From the one side, working with the companies to say, what are your difficulties, what are the constraints? It's also coming from the community aspect, from civil society's point of view, from the provider's point of view, to say what is needed, um, where are the gaps? And it's bringing evidence to the picture. And, and by, I think, coming at it from more than one angle, we really do begin to see 
solutions to the problems, um, ways to solve the challenges. And, and I think that is what is unique about access to medicine, is it's bringing and using facts and coming at the problem from, from more than one angle. Um, and we're starting to see uh, real change being made, not only from the company's point of views, but also from how the global community views this problem. Um, so I think, you know, great uh, strides have been made, are being made, and I really predict that we will continue to see those changes coming in the future. The Access to Medicine Foundation uses this very important tool, um, which is an index, uh, that really holds companies accountable to how much access planning they do from the get-go and then throughout the life of a product or in, in the work that they do. Um, so I think it's that accountability is, is absolutely key to this. Um, and it's done in such a way that I think companies can come on board and actually join the collaboration. Um, I think that's very important because that really sets a, a playbook, if you like, or a script for how to do this. So when a new life-saving commodity comes about or disease-preventing commodity comes about, that access planning can begin right from the beginning um, and ensure that we don't have the kind of inequity we've seen even as recently as the COVID-19 pandemic. I was very disappointed, um, you know, having lived through HIV in the change of the millennium in 2000 uh, and, and not having access to antiretroviral therapy, to see a very similar picture in 2020 and 2021, when there was such a demand for SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccination. And again, we had a situation where the vaccines were in high and middle income countries and none in low uh, income countries. And, and that access to vaccines was withheld. You know, that really was, um, I think, a situation that could have been avoided had we had access planning from the get go. I'm a global health um, activist. I, I really believe that, you know, health is a human right um, and no one should be left behind. I work for the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation and I withhold uh, the values of the late Emeritus Desmond Tutu, who believed that every human soul uh, has a, a right to basic human rights and health. Um, and as such, I believe that treatment, life-saving uh, medicine, really is part of that basic human right. Um, and so the work that the Access to Medicine Foundation does is incredibly close to my heart. I think they are onto a wonderful uh, way of solving the problem, or at least challenging the problem. And so uh, with the opportunity to join the supervisory role, I really, you know, was honored and incredibly excited to, to play even a small part in, in bringing about this important work. Um, and it's an incredible team. They truly are excellent at what they do. And so being in a position really to uh, to work with them in guiding strategy and finding ways to do to sustain this work, but also strengthen the work. I think was uh, an, you know just a, a, a terrific privilege and, and honor for me. I'm excited to see how we can really take the work forward um, and really begin to impact many fields of medicine, not just uh, infectious diseases, but beyond. Um, and I, I believe that this can be done. As a global health practitioner who really cares about making sure that we get the best possible care for even the poorest of individuals, uh, you, the, the insights that the Access to Medicine Foundation brings is a powerful tool for me. Um, to be able to really bring about change together with 
access to medicine foundation by working with governments, with regulators, even creating awareness amongst the patients themselves about what the possibilities are. And so I'm very excited about the the future uh, and the you know just the the exciting prospect of using these insights to bring about change to make sure that nobody is left behind uh, and that we really uh, you know, save lives by bringing medicines to those who need it most.